Things spiral out of the ESF's control. Although the threat of monetary reform was gone, the ESF, in trying to defend the dollar, was essentially running a giant Ponzi scheme that was doomed to failure. The steady drop in U.S. gold defied all attempts to plug the drain, and by 1967 the United States was at the brink of a fiscal crisis. The London gold pool failed in 1968 in the face of the largest gold rush in history. Buyers throughout Europe demanded gold, and mob scenes erupted as the price soared. Many refused to accept U.S dollars as payment. Gold stocks were cleaned out virtually overnight. The trading in gold was colossal. The rush was on because speculators had become convinced that the U.S. was nearing the end of its gold tether. Having tasted blood and scenting the kill, they ripped and clawed the remaining gold stocks from the gold pool. The whole international monetary system was collapsing. With the Treasury controlling its actions, confidence in the Fed collapsed. The Fed became a joke. The Federal Reserve hurls thunderbolts and nothing happens. It tells the world solemnly that, by golly, it means business in stopping inflation, but it doesn't know how. U.S. deficits spiraled out of control, and the more money these deficits created, the more severe the inflation. The law of supply and demand made this inevitable. Declining currencies accelerate as they fall, and the dollar was crashing against gold, and consumer prices were soaring parabolically. The ESF's Rosa bonds and Ford transactions created losses as the dollar depreciated. The ESF soon registered a negative capital position. It was technically bankrupt. A sense of fear of the unknown was being transmitted by the normally cool operators of the New York Fed. Not only was the dollar falling against stronger currencies, but also weaker ones. There was a sense of panic. In newspapers, the Treasury was being openly ridiculed. Then, in 1979, the dollar lost its biggest support. The European community was determined to avoid further inflation. And so the Treasury was told that support from Europe was gone. The vulnerability of the dollar was impossible to describe. Congress was warned that America was about to experience a holocaust of runaway inflation, a cataclysm which would make the Depression seem like a tea party. Then deficits stopped mattering. In 1981, caught in a tide of red ink, administration officials tried, somewhat implausibly, to downplay the traditional view that deficits lead to spiraling prices. Stunned audiences were told that there is no direct or indirect connection between deficits and inflation. The U.S. then ran massive deficits, and inflation went down. The link between deficits and inflation broke completely. For the record, this is the equivalent of an African shaman declaring he has mystical powers and then levitating himself in a ring of fire. After deficits stopped mattering, the dollar soared and the ESF's profits skyrocketed. In 1980, after dumping 100,000 tons of gold onto the market in a desperate attempt to keep prices down, the Treasury halted regular gold sales. Gold prices then entered a 20-year bear market. Remember the variety of stratagems the ESF used to arm itself with foreign currencies by borrowing from abroad? Well, after 1980, this stopped being a problem. The all-knowing, all-seeing Fed did what it had to do to kill inflation without ever stopping printing money. We were spending our way to prosperity, enjoying the best economy in years, low unemployment, high profits, trivial inflation, all fueled by our willingness to go deeply into debt in the cause of immediate gratification. It was called disinflation, and it was here to stay. Sure, the majority of financial experts had been expecting a wave of inflation, a rerun of the 1970s only worse, but things didn't work out that way. Thanks to the magic of disinflation, as for questions like, why did interest rates enter a 30-year downward trend, or how the hell does this disinflation thing work? Well, they remain unanswered. Why deficits stopped mattering. In the 1980s, the link between deficits and inflation was broken, but the money printing never stopped. How did the ESF pull off this magic trick? Well, it is possible to print money without causing inflation. For example, if the government prints billions, and those billions disappeared overseas, there would be no inflation. This is exactly what happened in the 1980s, when a large part of the U.S. currency went missing, disappearing into the hands of foreigners, and the supply of dollars in the U.S. stopped growing, and 
ending inflation. This wasn't an accident since in 1981, administration officials started telling the entire world that deficits don't matter. They knew that billions of dollars were about to disappear overseas. This leads to two very important questions. Where did these disappearing dollars go and why did they leave the US? Iran-Contra and the Reagan Doctrine Finding the missing dollars is not hard. The New York Times reported in 1990 that Nicaragua was using a new currency. Against a background of hyperinflation, all Nicaraguans scrambled to convert their Cordobas into American currency. So why did the Nicaraguan Cordoba collapse in the 1980s? Well, John Stockwell gives us the answer by describing the CIA's bloody campaign to destabilize Nicaragua beginning in 1981, the year deficits stopped mattering. When the US doesn't like a government, they send in the CIA to tear apart the social and economic fabric of the country. In other words, creating terrible conditions. To destabilize Nicaragua, the US began funding this force called the Contras. And the Contras, under US direction, systematically blew up granaries, sawmills, bridges, government offices, schools, and health centers. One example of hard proof of the CIA's involvement in all this is the Sabotage Manual, which was a comic book style manual that encouraged Nicaraguans to hurl Molotov cocktails and engage and other forms of sabotage. The Contras also systematically assassinated religious workers, teachers, health workers, elected officials, and government administrators. To help with all this, the CIA provided an assassination manual to the Contras. It caused quite a stir when it surfaced in 1984. This was all part of Iran-Contra, when the United States armed and trained Honduras-based militants to topple the government of Nicaragua, even after Congress made it illegal. The Contras' form of warfare was one of systematic and bloody human rights abuse, of murder, torture, mutilation, rape, arson, destruction, and kidnapping. The atrocities are well documented, and they were financed through the ESF. America was at war with Nicaragua. Navy ships supervised the mining of harbors, while US planes bombed the capital. And this bloody CIA campaign was part of the Reagan Doctrine, an effort to roll back communist regimes in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Nicaragua was just one of many destabilizations. All of which were bloody horrifying affairs. These thousands of brutal CIA covert actions, which destabilized a third of the countries in the world, are what saved the dollar in the 1980s. That leaves only the question of how these disappearing dollars traveled from the United States to places like Nicaragua. Dollarizing the world. Dollarization is the process whereby the US dollar supplants a country's national currency as the medium of exchange. Many countries have an enormous quantity of dollars in circulation. Where did these greenbacks come from? Well, the most reasonable explanation is drug money laundering, which brings us to bulk currency smuggling, the primary method for expatriating drug proceeds from the United States. This dollar smuggling takes place through air cargo, outbound freighter, and the same vehicles used to smuggle cocaine in. When you add together the cash smuggled out of America by Mexican, South American, and Canadian drug dealers, you realize that the total bulk currency smuggling is huge. This bulk currency smuggling took off in the 80s as a result result of an intensifying crackdown on money laundering by banks who were under threat of heavy fines from federal authorities. This campaign against money laundering explains the huge outflow of dollars to the rest of the world. By tightening currency restrictions, the Treasury forced launderers to resort to bulk currency shipments. These controls on bank accounts and wire transfers have grown ever stricter, forcing more and more cash out of the United States. And all these outgoing laundered greenbacks dollarized the world. In Afghanistan right now, the Afghani and the dollar are pretty much interchangeable. The illicit trade in opium has single-handedly introduced the dollar to the region. Meanwhile, the American coca trade has led to mass addiction and the vicious dollarization of Latin America. In 1986, as a result of Iran-Contra, it came to light that the US government was directly developing massive cartel infrastructure in Central America. Thousands of tons of cocaine were brought into the US, and the money was used to introduce the dollar to the entire Latin America our region. The US dollar is now the standard currency for El Salvador and Panama, and it is simply the unofficial de facto tender in the rest of the region. That's right, nearly every country in the Americas involved in producing, transporting, and using cocaine is using the US dollar as a medium for exchange. Treasury profits from the war on drugs. The huge inflow of narcotics during the 80s did more than just dollarize the world. It also delivered massive profits to the Treasury and the ESF. The government began confiscating enormous quantities of property and cash, and the proceeds were funneled directly into the U.S. Treasury. This was all part of the government's drug forfeiture program, which was radically expanded in the 80s. This innovative effort gave the U.S. Treasury title
title to any property used in a drug transaction. Federal law now grants the government extremely wide license in forfeiture cases. We've gotten to the point where virtually anything can be seized if it has substantial connection to drug trafficking. And since the Justice Department has budget targets it must meet, federal undercover agents and informants are schooled in the financial importance of arranging a drug sale on or near valuable real estate so that the entire track can be seized through the government's forfeiture program. Informants are often rewarded with a percentage of the assets they deliver this way. Thus, the family home is fair game for forfeiture if a relative or friend were to use it unlawfully. For example, the government took away the home of a New Jersey woman under the claim it was purchased with drug profits, but the house was actually bought three years before the drug offenses. The forfeiture situation is totally out of control. It has become a dysfunctional policy where efficiency is measured by the amount of money seized rather than the impact on drug trafficking. Narcotics units prefer seizing cash rather than confiscating drugs and reducing the supply reaching the streets. Those dogs you see at the border aren't looking for drugs. They are currency sniffing dogs. It is important to note that the more drugs come into the U.S., the more the Treasury profits.